I, I guess the most important thing to say is like this is not the draft spec for presentation four. Can you all see my screen? I'll make yeah. It yes. Bigger. Thank you. Oh, hang on. I'm making Zoom window bigger. That's not right. I want to make this window bigger. <laughs> That's better. Right. Uh, yeah. So, you know, because obviously if we'd sort of started with a clean slate and started writing the presentation for spec, we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't have got anywhere in the two days we had available to us. So effectively what we're writing is a kind of, they're like fragments or snippets from the eventual spec, but relative to the new stuff. So it kind of assumes a familiarity with presentation three and it doesn't define all the concepts that you might find in presentation three. So it's like little kind of snippets of new stuff that might have come from that spec. Um, but we also think we're going to reorganize the spec to make annotations uh, um, and painting annotations more uh, explained. Um, I'm just going to move the Zoom stuff over the other side. And, um, right. So, yeah, uh, I'll just start at the beginning. So one of the things, obviously, we introduced scene. So, and one of the things, there's an issue I posted on GitHub the other day about whether like as we introduced scene, we wondered whether, you know, because we're making a step forward in dimensions and then adding a new class as a as a content container, whether we should also take a step back and add a timeline class. I'm not going to go into that because that's not relevant to what we're talking about, but it's just a little bit of background. So yeah, so we, yeah, you know, I'm not going to go into this in great detail because this represents established stuff that the TSG has already decided on. There is a class called a scene and it has a right-handed coordinate system and it looks like that. Uh, and we use the scene uh, as a container for content via the mechanism of annotations. Uh, and we can place 3D models in the scene. And we can also place lights and cameras in the scene. And a scene can have multiple lights and cameras and other resources. And it could have all the kind of commenting annotations or even you know, transcriptions or translations or any other kind of uh, uh, annotations that other uh, existing chip life has. So nothing odd here. Uh, first new property here is background color of scene. So that's a new property added to the scene class. And also we will retrospectively add it to the canvas class for reasons which will become apparent when we want to put canvases into 2D scenes. Um, so you know, that's that's about as far as we're going in, in, in this draft, at least towards any kind of skybox or background concept, just a uh, color. Um, so, right, so we've defined a scene. Now let's start thinking of putting things in scene. And these are familiar concepts. You're going to have seen these, you know, sometimes the documentation here as a first pass is like a kind of, you know, even just a kind of rephrasing of something you might see in 3JS. So we have two types of cameras that we can place in scenes, perspective camera and orthographic, be expected. Uh, they have near and far properties, just like they do in 3JS and many other libraries uh, that define obviously where, you know, content within the scene uh, you know, the actual range of content that the camera will um, show up. Uh, a perspective camera has a field of view. Uh, and there's a, a, a diagram crib from, I think, Wikipedia, just to define uh, near and far. So again, nothing unusual for anyone familiar with 3D concepts. Uh, right, and then we start getting into behaviors of a IIIF client. So if a uh, scene does not have any cameras in it, as, you know, placed into the scene through annotation, then a client, a viewer, must provide a default camera so that there's something to look at. But that's up to, you know, we think we shouldn't uh, impose any constraints on viewers. It's up to them to provide cameras for their scenes. And similarly, we'll see the same is true for lights. If the publisher author of the manifest does not include lights and cameras, it's up to the viewer how it lights and views the scene. So yeah, so here is a typical perspective character uh, camera as a JSON object. And lights, again, familiar from uh, other 3D uh, libraries. We have ambient light, directional light, point light, and spotlight. Uh, lights have a color and an intensity, and the color is an RGB string, case insensitive. Um, uh, intensity is, uh, as we discussed in Washington, uh, at the you know using that value construct at the moment, it will be a just a number between zero and one. But we, uh, I don't think we covered this in the spec. I don't think we've got to that bit yet about the, the values. Um, but yeah, uh, leaving room for later uh, providing uh, actual kind of units for intensity, like lumens or whatever. But at the moment, it's just a a, a, a scale from zero to one. Um, Spotlight has an additional angle. We spent some time wondering whether it was the half angle or the full angle. 
uh, and it seems to be different different approaches in different libraries. So we've settled on it being uh, that angle as you that you can see in the picture, rather than the full angle. Um, plus five in degrees. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Floating point. So if you want forty five point three degrees, that's fine. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um but, but, so yeah and just uh, some yeah again obviously the spec has to specify behavior if i put a light in a scene but i don't point it at anything it points downwards in the negative y direction uh if i don't position it within the scene it's at the origin uh, and then we've just kind of leaving again as triple life is open for extension we leave other potential properties of lights up to clients uh and again as with cameras if the scene does not provide a light the client the viewer can provide its own one but how it does that is entirely up to the viewer uh how the lights are positioned how the lights and cameras are positioned in the scene are then covered in painting annotations so this is where when we you know when the full version of the spec uh, emerges the, the kind of ordering and introduction of concepts you know we think we can do a better job than in the current spec about introducing painting annotations as the fundamental mechanism so obviously you know when you in specs like this everything needs to come before everything else <laughs> um but it has to come in a certain order so this is the order it is at the moment so yeah if you're familiar with annotations uh you know we have we place stuff in our scene through painting annotations now one of the things that we probably you know just made us decide we need to call out a bit more is the use of selectors and specific resources, which are part of the W3C model, which are going to be much, much more required for usage in, in, in 3D scenes than they are in the in um, uh, 2D content. Um, well, Jamie says, the light, you know, the scene must have a light. Yes, good, good, good point. Uh, I guess the clarification of that would be the scene must end up having a light. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, there's some, there's some lots of there's all there's lots and lots of language uh, uh finishing he's doing with this this is what we basically wrote on thursday and friday um bu, 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 bu. yeah so du, 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 du. yeah um yeah all resources that can be added to the scene have an implicit or explicit local coordinate space so obviously lights and cameras are just conceptual things uh uh, whereas models might come with their own coordinate space. Um, but we assume that, you know, if it, it, uh, uh, that there is an origin to be transformed. There's an origin of the thing to be placed in the scene that is going to be transformed into the scene. Um, and this is done uh, yeah, by aligning the origins of the two coordinate spaces. Yeah, uh, Tom, if, yeah, if you don't mind if I throw in a second. Yeah, yeah, one, I yeah, think... yeah you, you yeah. explain this better than I will. Yeah. Well, I think yeah, I think the reason why we put that discussion between is we want we wanted to to get readers thinking about this concept of like that any resource to be put most resources to be put into the scene have their own local coordinate space or in other words it's it's really a way of like getting people in the right frame of reference to think about things like transforms later on because we have to make points that say um you know, that a scale transform is applied to the local coordinate space of a model. Another way of saying that is if you are putting a 3D model into a space and you do a scale transform, the scale is applied from the origin of that model's coordinate space, not from necessarily the centroid of the model. So that like, if you have a model that's off the origin and you scale it by two, it's actually gonna end up further away from the coordinate origin in addition to just growing twice the size. So it's just it's just trying to get people thinking about this distinction between the 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 local coordinate space of the resource and then the the scene coordinate space. Hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And so then the spec introduces this concept of a point selector, which is going to be really used very heavily in 3D. It's there in the presentation three spec already, uh, but is only going to be used for like you know, particular, uh, especially time-based use cases at the moment. But with three D, it's it's yeah, it's how you it's how you point things at points or position things at points in the scene. Um, um, obviously, they have X Y Z properties. They also have a time property called instant because it's a point, not an extent of time. 
uh, we lost a few hours on the issue of what this was called because in the presentation three, this is called T. Uh, and I won't go into the details, but there are reasons why we can't call it T because it conflicts with the media fragments T, which we'll see in a second. Uh, so yeah, but so we have a we have a a, a spatial position x y z and an optional temporal point instant in seconds. Mm. Here is an example of placing. Here is an annotation that places model one dot glb into the scene. So again, the target of the scene, uh, the, the target of this annotation is the scene. The specific, uh, the, the, a specific resource whose source is the scene and whose specific selector is a point selector which provides the coordinates. Yeah. Uh, and here is one of the reasons why. So, you know, many people, you know, if you look at probably the vast, vast majority of IIIF manifests out there today, they use this kind of syntax for positioning uh, things. So, well, the vast majority just target the whole scene. Uh, so they would only have a target that looked like this. So not an object, but just a URI. That's the scene, uh, the scene ID. Uh, and then if they do target a rectangular region, they use an X Y width height syntax for canvases. And we want to echo that by allowing an X Y Z syntax for spaces that can just be a fragment uh, on the end. And here is, and um, yeah, that that was where our, our our conflict with the media fragment that Julie just mentioned is that T in the media fragment syntax, which would go here, represents an interval not a point uh so uh that's why we renamed uh, the point selector instant uh so here we go right on to so do, yeah does, does i mean does that like this is the kind of crucial thing this is like triple f 3d 101 is is the json you see on the screen there this is how this is a an annotation that places a model in a scene at a point so yeah so obviously there you know, this is fine if uh, we're in a kind of you know, a universe where there's only one model and it's positioned in the scene and its scale even isn't really going to affect the viewing experience. But as soon as we need to uh, put more than one thing in the scene, then we need to move things around and scale them and, and rotate them and all that kind of stuff. So we have three classes of transform which can be applied uh, you know, for the, as the annotation positions things in the scene. Uh, once it's positioned, or sorry, before it's positioned in the scene, it can be uh, have these trans transformations applied, and they you know, they are making it bigger <laughs> or smaller, yeah. uh, rotating it uh, around whichever axes it needs to be rotated around, and translating it, moving it in its local coordinate space. Um, and here we have an example. I'll just go straight into the example. So yeah, this is the model. The astronaut or whatever it is before it's being being placed in the scene it's being flipped 180 degrees and moved so that it's you know if it was at its origin it's now one unit off of its origin before it is placed in the scene uh it can be have these transforms applied uh and then for convenience and again echoing many constructs in existing libraries uh we have a look at construct. So rather than work out uh, you know, where something like a light or camera, well, where a light or camera should be facing, we can say, you, you know, work out where it should be facing by pointing it at this thing. And again, a point selector is the property of this. Now, in this example, we're looking at a point selector. We're looking at a particular point in the coordinate space. And in some of the example manifests, we'll see that the look at property can take two different types of resource. So you can either take a point selector, uh, which provides the point directly, or even more conveniently, if you have already placed, say, the astronaut in the scene, the ID of the painting annotation that places the astronaut in the scene, you can look at that ID uh, rather than kind of dig down and work out what point uh, you, you want it to, 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 to look at. And you might use that uh, for yeah looking at models within the scene, but you also might use it for navigating around uh comments or descriptive annotations or something like that you know look at this one look at this one look at this one so yeah it, so yeah the, the value of a, the look at property can be a point selector or uh another annotation that's already in the scene uh mm -hmm. and then the kind of uh the idea of putting a scene inside a scene or another yeah, a, a, another a, a triple i canvas with inside a scene 
And this is probably an immensely powerful uh, concept because it mirrors the uh, kind of notion of grouping that you might have in a 3D editing environment or, or a 2D editing environment. You know, here, here are some resources and I want to group them and then move them all in or transform them or scale them together. Uh, and to do that, you know, that's just kind of making a scene, a triple F scene, and arranging it how you want, and then bringing the whole scene in as a content resource into another scene. And the same transforms that apply on it, on bringing a model into a scene can apply to bring another scene into a scene. So yeah, it works just like a group or un, you know, yeah, group thing on on resources. Uh, so here, yeah, we're here. We're in, here. We're, we've got one scene that is being placed into this scene. Now, one thing. Sorry, are, are any questions before I carry on to the next section? And nesting will apply to canvases is the idea is yeah so, so 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 this is the this is the interesting use case about you know obviously uh placing 2d 2d content into 3d scenes so the mechanism for doing that and we, we decided that the spec and there's maybe a thing for discussion or, uh, to, or to be challenged on but we decided that the spec should not you know it sh should assume that if you want to do this whether the whether the 2d content is a video or an image or an image with an image service uh, whatever it might be, that the the way to do that is not just do it directly, but to do it with a canvas, a triple life canvas. So to put the two D content in a triple life canvas, and it may already be in a triple life canvas, uh, probably yeah. even likely to be, and then placing the canvas uh, into the scene. And this this is again, this is this is one to really test uh, yeah. and 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 kind of kick kick tires on and really make sure it works properly. Uh, and so. Um, yeah, uh, you know, because we have a canvas which is unitless width and height, spatial extent, and we want to place that, you know, that rectangle uh, into the three D space, um, yeah, you know, at some point. Um, so yeah, so when a canvas is painted as an annotation targeting a scene, the top left corner of the canvas is aligned with the three D coordinate origin of the scene, and yeah. I. Yeah, yeah. Can Sorry, I throw in one. real quick? Yeah, just because I, I think that is an, a, an interesting point where the discussion between the editors did diverge from, I think, some of the discussions we've had so far. So maybe it's worth mentioning that because we have in the spec yeah. that the top left corner of the canvas is at the origin. And so by default, it sort of extends down into the right so that the left edge is sort of going negative Y. And we yeah. just we just thought that We've in the group sometimes talked about the centroid, but I feel like among the editors, we just felt that there are so many assumptions of the canvas that its origin is at the top left that it's it that we were potentially creating headaches for ourselves down the line by 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 trying to use the centroid in in that three D context. So yeah, you could position a canvas at, uh, uh, in the scene at a point selection. Now, obviously, the canvas provides a two D coordinate system. Uh, which is typically going to have widths and heights in the thousands, uh, and the yeah, scene yeah. is going to typically going to have uh, a coordinate system, uh, probably a bit smaller than that, uh, um, in, in terms of you know, just, uh, units. So you, you're almost certainly going to want to scale your canvases when you place them. Now the thing is, this this way of doing it, uh, it might be tricky for some use cases, because you know effectively that that canvas that rectangle you might want to put that rectangle on any kind of you know bounded plane uh um in the scene and doing that the uh, using the other mechanism might be quite hard to work out so there are, you could place a canvas into the scene using a polygon z selector um you know which basically could paint it onto you know you could warp it or distort it and place it at any angle or you know uh, orientation uh, and uh, the you know, kind of direction the canvas is facing in the scene is determined by the order of points. Uh, so um, again, probably Julie can explain that better than me. But here, the mm. yeah, you know, like yeah, because because obviously a canvas has a front, uh, yeah. uh, and you don't want to like paint your the walls of your three D art gallery with uh, canvases that are facing the wall. Yeah. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> um, so. Uh, yeah, so this 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 construct allows you to do that, uh, um, and maybe easier for you know, certain use cases. Since we're, we're using the the WKT polygon Z expression, we just wanted to be very explicit about 
the order that the points should be listed in, and they're they're explicitly being listed in a counterclockwise winding order because this, mm -hmm. it's like this is the only place in the spec so far where we really have to worry about the specific coordinates that make up a polygon. Yeah. But you know, at least if we are going with a right-handed coordinate space using a counterclockwise winding order, should should give us basically the 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 front face of the canvas should be. Uh, as we intend it to be, which in yeah. this case is, you know, that this example is just, it's just drawing a simple canvas instead of sort of being below the x-axis, it's now above the x-axis with the left side on the positive y-axis. And it's, it's front with that counterclockwise winding order should point towards z positive. So it's just, and since as long as if we're starting from the top left, then it's best to just have a solid assumption that you go around counterclockwise. Mm -hmm. So that way, if I wanted to do something crazy, like uh, make an upside down canvas that had sort of like twisting skew, I could still do that and know exactly which coordinates I should specify when. Does that, does that make sense? It does. Uh, and uh, anyone else jump in if it's not clear. But so from this um, polygon, for instance, polygon Z, uh, the first of the quartet of numbers the first of the three set of three uh presumably is, is where the origin of the canvas would be placed in the canvas example so uh which is top left and then from there clockwise as you're saying the second set would be top right of the canvas counterclockwise so oh i thought you said clockwise top left. yeah count, yeah so right-handed coordinate systems and this is you know, also what 3JS uses, but it's also what probably most things that use a right-handed coordinate uh -huh. system use. Uh, you know, so top left, bottom left, bottom right, top right, which. Okay, counterclockwise. Yeah. I misheard you yeah. earlier or misunderstood. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. So, yeah. yeah, just yeah. just as a way of visualizing that, I think we're all familiar with uh, Ed's uh, infinite canvas demo. And yeah. We've obviously shown that many times. So like you could construct that by placing all those canvases you know, in the scene using these polygon Z selectors. Uh, but in like it, so what is the behavior? You know, you, they, they clearly have a front and back. Uh, and if you go around the back, you just see black. Yeah. So uh, now that's why we are retrospectively applying background color as a property to a 2D canvas so that you could actually make, you know, if, if you're, if you're a construct, if we construct a manifest for the infinite canvas demo, which I think we should have as one of our, our, yeah. um, uh, our, our demos, you would explicitly give these incoming 2D canvases a black background color. Yeah. And if you didn't give them a background color, they're assumed to be transparent. So you just see like the kind of mirror image you know, as if the paint, as if it was on gloss, as if sure. the painting was, uh, you know, you just look through the back of the painting. And you know, and that and that might be a completely valid thing that you want to do. So you would you would not give it a background color in that sense, in that case. But in many normal cases, you would want to give it a background color. So if you go around the back of the canvas, uh, you don't see a, you know, a mirror image, you see, whatever color you've uh, applied to the 2D canvas. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. No, it makes sense, sorry. Um, so yeah, so I think, so th those are the mechanisms for placing things in scenes. Uh, we did have a kind of, yeah, this exclude. So, you know, in all this interoperability and assembling of things, people are gonna be combining models that may have their own cameras or lights. And by default, uh, the behavior of a viewer should be that, it just makes those cameras and lights available to the scene, but that might just cause chaos and not be what you want. So you can have this exclude property that basically tells the client, the viewer, not to expose or you know, expose or expose the effects of um, various things that might be coming into the scene from from models brought into the scene, uh, and they are lights and cameras, obviously, but also audio and any animations that might be present in a model. So if the astronaut's spinning around or something, you might want to say, well, I don't do that because I don't want uh, my my statue garden to have spinning statues. <laughs> I, I, want them, I want them all to stay still um, or whatever. Uh, and similarly, you know, if you're bringing in lots of audio sources or, or scenes that contain audio, you might want to, to just turn that off. Uh, now the implementability of this is 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 one thing, but this is kind of probably necessary for uh, for defining a scene. 
Uh, it's got three minutes left. Uh, yeah. Just uh, yeah, just just go quickly. Uh, yeah, just as canvases can have a duration property in seconds, so can scenes. Uh, and this is where our T uh, comes into it. Uh, so in the uh, kind of as a really uh, verbose way of saying it, we need a point selector, but not with an instant. If we want this model to appear in the scene for forty-five or for, for fifty seconds, from forty-five to ninety-five, we need to do it in the verbose mechanism like this. But we could do that in a more short mechanism uh, like this. And this is where that T is a is a time span or extent rather than an instant, because this T is borrowed from the media fragment specification. Uh, so this is a more concise way of doing that and more in keeping with the concise way for 2D scenes. <coughs> uh, and yeah, but if we wanted to place something such as a, a comment, uh, or something like that, an instant, then that's the instant property of the point selector. And that's about the end of the kind of written up spec. And then there's some lot, lots of property definitions that would need to be assigned to various things, uh, scenes and, and cameras and lights uh, in spec. But that's, yeah, that's where we got to. And that's also, we're, we're, we're just, just, just to point out that, uh, where is it? This here contains a mixture of complete and in progress and not at all started demo manifests that show these things and as julie said right at the beginning there's like a big warning sign on these like <laughs> yeah these are very much work in progress but they and some of them will just contain errors but basically uh but but you know they are uh they are the beginnings of our cookbook recipes stroke test fixtures stroke you know, demo examples whatever brilliant i will brilliant. stop sharing now because we're at Nearly at time. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and <laughs> if, if I could add one last process thing. So in the running notes, and this is sort of an action item for, for everybody. Um, so we have all of those changes from the EDS branch wrapped up in a PR and the, uh, the pull request on the GitHub for IIIF3D. And that gives everybody, I mean, it's we, we could talk through this next week, but for all of the corrections or you know assumptions that someone wants to question or things to, to add comments about, you can that the PR makes a great place for those. You can either post general comments about the whole thing, or you can go to the changed files and you can actually add comments, questions, or suggestions on a file by file and line by line basis. So if you want to go to a specific place in the spec document and ask a question, the PR is great for that. So that's something awesome if people have, you know, for people to do between now and our next meeting is to use that PR to raise questions and thoughts. Uh, we spent maybe the first half of the first day generating a whole bunch of new manifests. And as part of that, we also reorganize those manifests a little bit just so that uh, people go look at those manifests. They may be organized slightly differently uh, than they were before. Uh, those manifests, it's important to say, are very much a first draft. There may be you know, issues or things that were missed in them. And some of those manifests, especially some of the ones that are like ZZ underscore, some of those are placeholders. Um, they have like a description saying what the manifest should do, but there's not really content in the manifest yet. And, uh, you know, after we review all the draft spec stuff in future weeks, if anyone on the TSG wants to help, you know, sketching out what those manifests should look like, that's totally something that would be great to have someone help with. But so there's been a, a bit of manifest reorganization. Also, right before the, the DC working meeting, uh, we put up some a guidelines document for uh, creating demos, basically for creating experiments that implement these like IIIF manifest recipes. It lays out acceptance criteria. It lays out the things that the demos must do, what they should do, and and some things that they could do as well. Uh, and so that's that's there for for technical people who are interested in getting involved in creating demos or implementations, that's that's like a great document to check out. Uh, I will say the list of milestone functionalities is probably already in, inaccurate, incorrect. I would suggest going and looking at the manifests, um, you know, and they're numbered uh, roughly in order of complexity. And the third, something that, that I just sort of bashed together in between moments over last week, uh, and it is linked in the uh, then in the running notes 
is I've added a code sandbox 3JS implementation of our most basic manifest. And, and I want to say it's, you know, for, for, for the developers in the room, it's almost trivial. It's literally, it's loading our most basic manifest. It's, it just takes in the astronaut, puts the astronaut at the origin of a scene. So this is the right. origin of the scene. The origin of the astronaut is at its feet. Um, but it is in code sandbox. It's using 3JS and it is loading a manifest from GitHub. It doesn't have any local files or anything like that. Here, I'll just pull up the manifest. So it's pulling that directly from GitHub, which is then pulling the astronaut model also from GitHub, and it okay. is reading that manifest. So cool. Straightforward, but you know, this this does it fulfills all the the musts and a couple of shoulds, because we do have in the should that ideally it should be on code sandbox. Um, and ideally it should load everything from, from GitHub rather than using local files. So that's linked in one of, in the appropriate issue on AAA 3D and it's in the running notes. So, um, you know, if anyone <laughs> likes working with 3JS, please feel free to take this and run with it and tear it apart and make it better. I'm planning on making another version of this that includes more of the shoulds. Um, but yeah, that's, that's where we are with that.